we have to come up with these ways of innovating that not only are different, but are better because it's very easy to draw a pretty picture, but to make it actually better than what's out there, then there's got to be a combination of not just the art side that makes you want to buy it, but it's also the science side. So that's what's cool about design. It's that mixture of art and science together. I am unwilling to give up that I will start over from scratch as many times as it takes to get where I want to be. I want to be. You just want to make sure you will get knocked down, but just make sure you don't get knocked out. Knocked out. So your only choice should be go focus on what you can control. 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 Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Kara Golden Show. Join me each week for inspiring conversations with some of the world's greatest leaders, We'll talk with founders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and really some of the most interesting people of our time. Can't wait to get started. Let's go. Let's go. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden, and this is the Kara Golden Show, and I am so excited to have my next guest here. I've been trying to get him on my show for a very long time since I met him at a conference in uh, Texas that we were both invited to speak at at NASA, and a uh, very funny story. Hopefully, we'll get into it at some point, but this is Frank Stevenson, icon. And I was fanning over him from the first time that I met him. And I was probably not his typical audience of people because I'm not a designer. I'm not, I mean, I drive cars, but I don't really understand cars nearly as much as Frank typically probably deals with, but just so inspiring on a lot of levels because I, I, have seen what he's done in terms of changing and disrupting the automotive industry. And what I always love is people who come in who into their industry and actually create a change that no one really saw coming. We didn't know we needed it. And then when it got there, we were like, oh, of course we needed it. And that really is what Frank has done. So Frank, uh, so for a little bit Uh, More background on Frank. So Frank is obviously an automobile designer, the automobile, I think, the automobile designer out there. And you may recognize a few of the brands that he's been instrumental in uh, working with, but also models, including the BMW SUV, the Mini, uh, has been involved with Ferrari and Maserati, Fiat, Lancia, Alfa Romero, and last but not least, the McLaren. And just unbelievable what you've accomplished. Uh, Motor Trend Magazine has called him one of the most influential automobile designers of our time. And he also was doing some other interesting stuff outside of designing. And we'll get into that a little bit. But anyway, welcome, welcome, welcome. So excited to (laughs) be here. He's uh, just outside of London and uh, where he lives. So very excited to have you here. Thank you, Kara. I can just feel the energy in your voice and it's lifting me up already. (laughs) Not that designers need lifting up. We usually positive people anyway. Oh, that's so nice. So yeah. so let's talk a little bit about about Frank. So where where did you grow up? Oh, um I'll, that one it can be a long story. I'll try to keep it short, Carrie, because it, it does tend to be a long one. But I was actually born and raised in Casablanca, Morocco. And my father is an American and my mother is Spanish. So I I really can't tell you if I feel American or if I feel Spanish. I kind of feel both. I guess it just depends on the situation where that I find myself in, if I'm more Latin or more more American. But at the same time, it's a great way to 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 to, to go through your youth because I lived there until I was 11. So I was exposed to a lot of different cultures. And in the 60s, when I grew up in Casablanca, it was mainly French, although obviously Arabic and that. But the the main language is is not Arabic in Casablanca. It's actually French. And so I grew up exposed to a variety of cultures. My parents being sort of polar opposites in 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 temperatures. My my father was cold and calculated. My mother was hot and passionate. <laughs> and I had an older brother who's completely different from myself. But uh yeah, I grew up there in the 60s and early 70s. And then uh 
went to an international school and learned a couple other languages. So I was pretty, pretty uh, okay, I guess, with languages until um, till when I was 11. We then moved to Istanbul, Turkey. And so transferred schools and, you know, lose all your friends and things and start all over again. And uh, studied in Istanbul until I was 16. And then we moved from there to Madrid, Spain, where I graduated in my, my senior year from a high school in Madrid and um, did pretty well. And I was supposed to go to college. But in the early 60s, my father had actually started a car dealership in the south of Spain. And that was being run by my uncle, my mother's brother. And it was kind of expected that when I finished high school, I would go down there and work in, in the dealership as uh, whatever. <laughs> and I actually got interested in racing motorcycles my last year of high school in Madrid. I met a guy who was racing and went to a few races and I got the virus there. And so I, I asked my father if I could have a year off before I started uh, work. And he said, sure, you know, get it out of your system. So so I got a bike, a motorcycle, and uh, started practicing and uh, racing and, and did pretty well. The first year I raced, I was the national junior champion. And, of course, he said, keep going. So I won the next year in the senior championship. And then after that, it became a career because I got uh, what we call a factory ride uh, from a Japanese manufacturer. And so I was able to do sort of be an international rider, riding all over the world in the world championships for Four years, did pretty good. But after four years, I, I hadn't won, which was my father's viewpoint was if you don't win, you know, there's no sense in being in the game. So nobody really remembers second place. So I got out and had to make a decision, either go to work with him or go off and study. So I uh, decided to go to study card design in California. And I moved there in 82 and graduated Where did you go? in 86. By the way? Well, that's the design college. They call it the the place that you go to. If you can get in, you're you're doing pretty good. If you get out, you're absolutely uh, <laughs> it's a miracle. If you get out of this school alive, um, basically the people who finish are, are almost guaranteed a job. So that's in Pasadena, California, so mm -hmm. just outside of LA, and it's called the Art Center College of Design, and it's really small, but it's it's the powerhouse university for design in the world, I'd say. And basically, they almost try to make you not graduate, but hmm. that is the the level that they put you through to almost guarantee that when you're when you're finished, when you graduate, you're ready to hit the road running. So you you go through a a really rigorous training program. <laughs> now, did you th had you been drawing a lot be prior to that, or were you? Yeah. Well, actually, you know, I, I, I yeah, I had to because not not I had to it was my since I can't remember when I, I mean I walk around with this since I can't remember. If I'm not riding a motorcycle, I'm, I've got a pen in my hand. So I've, I'm one of those strange guys that can write better than talk so uh, or, or draw better than I can talk. Interesting. So uh, I, I grew up as a kid not wanting to go outside and play. I stayed basically at home and drew all day. And my mother had to kick me out of the house to get fresh air and, you know, force me to go out and get in the sandbox or something. So I, I was drawing everything when I was a kid. And then eventually, because of the dealership that my father had when I was about – 10 i started to draw the cars in the dealership just for fun and so that kind of love for cars and love for uh drawing basically melded it or molded itself together and so i i was learning a profession that i didn't even know existed when i was you know 17 18 19 years old i had no idea that cars were actually designed i thought they you know somebody pulled a, a lever and out popped a car kind of thing you know and i didn't know that people actually drew cars for a living but when I was 22 and I had to make that life decision of what I was going to be doing, either staying in motocross racing or working for my father's dealership or or do some kind of studies, I coincidentally, it was uh, serendipity, but I learned about this university in California that they actually taught car design. And I thought, well, you know, what cooler Why thing not? to do with your life if you if they pay you to draw a car. You can't can't, you know, can't be much more of a dream profession than that. So I did that. It's so interesting. I always talk about how in your journey, these dots 
They like later mm. on in life, you can look back and how they connect, but you didn't know yeah. it, right? Like your dad- Well, it's in front up, of you. Right, yeah. right. Your dad is jumps into a dealership and uh-huh. you're like, okay, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll go there. And then I just start drawing other things. I mean, that's yeah, amazing. But what, little do you know that it is it is a dream profession for a lot of, now more so than ever, because I think, you know, when I was back then, we didn't have the internet. We didn't, you know, there was no way of really knowing what a professional designer actually did, and especially because design is one of those professions that you don't get into that side of the company because it's very secret. They don't really tell you what's going on in the design studio. Design studios don't typically work, you know, one or two years into the future. They're working five to 10 years into the future. So what's going on, within the design community or in a design company is, is not really t- talked about. It's a fascinating place because you actually, every day you walk in the studio, it's like walking five years into the future. Everything else seems boring when you walk out of it. You know, you've seen it before. Right. It might be new to normal people on the road, but for you, that's like, that's five years old already. And you know what's coming. So it's, um, it's a really, you're living, living, dreaming, you know, everything, thinking it your whole life switches to a mode where you're almost like a future person in the sense that you know these new materials that are going to be coming out that people have no idea about or new technologies that don't exist today but are coming, coming because out. you're working directly with a supplier so you kind of you kind of looked at as a strange one that you know and we have to be the strange ones in the company because that's what they pay us for is to have these brand new ideas that really don't make sense today but and when you were saying you didn't know that you needed it, but when you saw it, you wanted it. That's totally. that's what we do is we have to come up with these ways of innovating um, that not only are different, but are better because it's very easy to draw a pretty picture. But to make it actually better than what's out there, technology and practical and all that, then, then there's got to be a combination of not just the art side that makes you want to buy it but it's also the science side. So that's what's cool about design. It's that mixture of art and science together. You know, art is an artist, but a designer kind of has to mix the engineering and the art together. And that's that's fascinating, especially when you're when you're that far, you know, if you're doing fashion, you're probably working for next year's collection or or something or architecture might be 2 years out, but when you're actually designing a car, that car is going to be coming out probably in 5 years, but it still has to look fresh for another 3 years. So if you total that, that's eight years that you're designing ahead of yourself. And you don't even know, you know, you're not really asking people what they will want in eight years. Nobody really knows what, what they want in eight years. So you kind of have to predict the trends or or dictate the trends almost. There's a really good saying that I had once that was, um, the future is not faded, it's created. You know, it's just, don't sit back and let the future happen. It's it's going to be what you want it to be. So I love that's that. the fun part. Mm. Well, one another one of uh, one of my icons that I followed for many many years uh, is Steve Jobs, and he always mm. talked about a very similar. I mean, people would ask him, "Do you do focus groups?" And he didn't believe in focus groups. He believed yeah. <laughs> in actually sharing. Uh, and basically telling the consumer, ultimately, figuring out what the problems are out there mm-hmm. and then solving for it and saying, here it is. And mm-hmm. I very much, we we very much think the same way at Hint when, you know, people will say, do you have lots of focus groups? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll share with my my uh, millennial Gen, Gen Z kids and they'll tell me it sucks or, you know, yeah. like, right. They'll yeah. be very too brutally honest <laughs> with uh, different stuff. But in general, we are not um, focused. So you don't use focus groups along the way? I, you guys have- I absolutely, I despise focus groups because what happens is you tend to get watered down, watered down products, mm-hmm. no pun intended, but very diluted things because, you know, it, it the, the future will shock a lot of people. The objective is not to shock people, but to make them accept it on an emotional level. And and obviously we move forward all the time. You know, designers don't want to repeat. And there's all kinds of things about retro design and how sometimes that's appealing. But the true definition of design is that you're creating something that connects that product emotionally to the buyer, that makes the buyer want to have it. 
You know, even if they don't need it, they still want to have it because there's this emotional connection that you build through the aesthetics of the aesthetics of the product. Yet at the same time, there's no sense in adding to the world products that the world doesn't really need because it's already out there. So the objective has to be that every time you design something, you're adding something beneficial or you're bringing something innovative or better to the market than what's already out there. Because just to be, like I said, racing second best means nothing. You know, it's just it's a waste of energy and things you want always when you do something to to release the very best product out there and uh, a lot of people say you know that's well that's expensive and we don't have a budget for to be the best well you know i'm sorry but the <laughs> the best doesn't have to be expensive there's a lot of ways to get around that also you know people think that uh the best means higher prices but there's there's that's not true um but again yeah it's just um you know, not not really asking everybody what they want because what it does often take is experience. So, mm-hmm. I've always relied a lot on gut instinct. Mm-hmm. So, what what my experience gut instinct is is good when you have experience. At the beginning, you can't really rely on it. Yeah, definitely. and and you know, you, and unless you get you know, you want to be proven right most of the time. But once you get that sort of belief in yourself and confidence that your gut instinct can tend to be correct. Well, then there's really no no sense in asking everybody what they want because you know you can't please everybody all the time. What's that thing about politics? You can fool some of the people all the time, and you can fool all the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. That kind of so thing true. goes in design. As long as you're batting over fifty percent, you know, or over five hundred, you're doing pretty well. I love it. So um, I love it. So f- so first real kind of job in design. Where was that? Uh, I, well, I halfway through Art Center College of Design, I got a uh, 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 well. Four the big three come to the university typically halfway through your studies there, and it's kind of like um, you know, like when you have the draft in 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 the professional sports where they kind of look at the players uh, a little bit before they graduate from college, and then they know who they're going to try to sign up on graduation. Well, the big three, which are Chrysler, Ford, and GM would come to the university, check out the students and sort of keep their eye on them. Um, so halfway through my studies, Ford offered me a position on graduation if I signed with them and said, uh, we'll pay for the rest of your studies if you sign with us now. So I did that. So it was a big load off my mind. So I went, so when I graduated, I already had, uh, I was already with Ford or signed up to go to Ford. I just didn't want to go to Detroit, you know, because I'd experienced Detroit a couple of times. And I, I thought that's probably one of the most violent cities that a designer can live in. You want to feel good and happy at that, and safe. At that when, time, it's gotten better, but it's... Uh, but, yeah, 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 this was the down period. This yes. is when uh, Detroit wasn't in a good... A place. They're, they're much better, of course, yeah. So they sent me to their European design headquarters in Cologne, West Germany, Köln in German. And uh, they have their European design quarters there. And it was fascinating. I mean, I moved right in, uh, went straight from university to there. And uh, a really, really international design team. Most of us had actually graduated and come from the same university. So we had a a similar way of seeing design. And that was the start of the Aero Jelly Bean period, I guess you could call it, in the mid-80s early 90s when Ford started doing these very, the first movement in aero design of cars that looked like they were uh, very aerodynamic. And that started with Ford, Ford design in that period. So I got, got to be involved in that stage, but the first car I have, I actually ever designed was, was crazy. I mean, um, I was handed the project because it was sort of like a project on the side, but it turned out to be very successful and it was a car that Ford did for for Europe, and it was called the Ford Escort, which is just a normal two door hatchback car that you wouldn't really look at twice. My roommate had an Escort in uh, in Gosh. college. Yeah, okay. she, uh, <laughs> yeah, and we, uh, yeah, that little Escort. It was like the little yeah, engine. That I think could. when they made it over there, <laughs> yeah, then they thought, well, let's do a sheep and wolf, uh, wolf and sheep's clothing. And let's make this car go racing in the World Rally Championship. So we need to add some stuff to it to make it look, uh, and not just look, but behave properly as a race car. So I got that project, and I, I I was so inspired and so enthusiastic because I'd just come out of university and already I was put on to a real project. I mean, I would have been happy doing hubcaps or door handles, but That's this was amazing, a amazing project that I got inspired and started thinking, well, 
you know, we don't just start drawing. We have to do some research and, and get inspired. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm sitting here in Germany and I need to do this car that's like a race car, turn it into a race car. What's the coolest thing that's ever come out of Germany that's iconic? And I was thinking of that, well, from a performance point of view, it was probably the Red Baron, his his yeah. airplane from uh, World War One that had the three wings on it, the Fokker DR1. So, so I did three wings on the back of this car, and it looked absolutely fabulous, and it performed so well in the wind tunnel. Because with a car, you want that's why cars have wings on the back so they can keep the back end down and traction, and you know, stay on the road kind of thing, glued to the road. So these three wings had never been done before in car design. And and it was pretty awesome, and it was very German inspired, you know. So it suited Ford Germany very well. The problem is Ford's uh, bean counters, as we call them, the finance guys, have a lot of power in the organization. And we came to the very end of the project in the cost down meeting, where every department tries to take cost out of the out of the vehicle, out of the car. The, the finance guy said, "Well, what if we take out the middle wing? You know, how much are we going to save?" And it was oh, like five God. Deutsche marks. Yeah. And so they took it out because it made financial sense for them. But it was like your kid getting born with nine fingers and ten, instead of 10. And it really hurt me. But nobody knew about it. You know, it didn't know that the car was supposed to have three wings. And uh, it suffered from it. But it came out as a great story. And it was uh, there was a program in the States that said, well, let's put the three wings on like you intended it. And uh, they did it. And it it went viral. <laughs> that's that's so awesome. And so the next so, one yeah. was well, the next one I moved down to Munich. So after after I finished that project, I thought, well, that's great. You know, Ford's a great company to learn with. It's a bread and butter company, and they do a lot of different products. But I want to be a little bit more specialized and go up up a little bit. So I immediately applied down in the south of Germany to Mercedes, Porsche, Audi, and BMW, and I got interviews with them all. The problem was BMW told me they're not hiring, uh, but we'll look at your portfolio anyways to keep you on record. And when I went down to Munich, where the BMW was at, I was just blown away because it's the best location in Germany probably to live. You're right up against the Alps, Austria, Switzerland, the lakes, everything. And uh, lucky enough, I was like, oh, this is really where I want to work. But they said uh, during the interview, OK, yeah, this is pretty good. You're welcome to start if you want. So I, I, I went straight to BMW. And worked there for the next 11 years. And uh, it was still when BMW was really small. They just had a three series car, five series car, and a seven series car, which people used to be funny and say, well, that's the same car. It's like one sausage, but in three different sizes, right? So they all look the same, but it, it was a great company and still growing. So I was really excited and I moved down to BMW. And lo and behold, I, I got a hold of another project that was super exciting, which was going to be their first SUV in BMW's history. And they asked me to, to design that car. And so I went down to Italy, where we have uh, some design companies that uh, can build your design very quickly. Because this car, I had to turn around in six weeks. Six weeks? Amazing. Yeah, it's, wow, it's, crazy. it's nuts. Cars take years to build at least a year to build a concept car and uh the boss wanted it in six weeks they just bought land rover which is part of the story and the big boss at bmw said okay let's now that we own land rover let's take a land rover platform and see what a bmw body could look like on this car and he asked for that to be seen in six weeks and my design boss then chris bengal thought it was a sketch program yeah we'll put up you know, six weeks, we'll get you nice sketches to look at. He said, no, I want to see it in six weeks, the actual oh full-size model. And the only way to do that is to go down to Italy because you can't work on the weekends in Munich because of the union. So we went. Th I went down there and drew the plane on the flight down, or drew the X5 on the, uh, on the plane on the flight down, landed on a Sunday, went to work on a Monday, and worked with three amazing Italian older guys, amazing it was like working with leonardo da vinci Raphael, and uh and michelangelo and we turned this project around from a sketch to a full-size car that was the first bmw x5 and brought it back to bmw and went straight to production so that was quick amazing and then i did the uh the next project which was probably the project of the millennium or the last century at least which was the opportunity to be um 
to see who would come up with a design for the new Mini of the 21st century. And the Mini was uh, under BMW's ownership. So it's British car, but or English car, but uh, they bought the brand Mini, they bought Land Rover and that. So they knew that the old Mini from 1959 had to be renovated or it would just die out. And so that everybody in, 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 in the world wanted to be the designer to work on the new successor to the Mini. And uh, luckily I got that and went straight into that and worked on it for five years. And the new Mini came out in 2000. And it's been doing very well ever since then. Which was so awesome on so many levels. I mean, uh, You don't I, know that when you're just... No, it. but I mean, it just you caught no everybody idea. by surprise. It was just such a it, such a great car. and It's a um, hoot to drive. Right. I, that's a, a word I learned in the States. It's a hoot. My cousin who lives in the States taught me a, a new word. I didn't know what hoot meant. She said, That's so well, the Mini's a hoot to drive. So, okay. so when did the McLaren come in? The McLaren came at the right time. All these moves just seemed to line up in my career. It's unbelievable. But I went from uh, doing the Mini to, to off the back of the Mini, getting a call from Ferrari and Maserati on uh, saying, okay, you're the guy that did that. Well, Can you imagine getting a, car, getting a call? I still, I, I, <laughs> still can't believe it. I mean, it. it's so uh, crazy. You no. Know, I mean, um, it was the weirdest thing. I was asked down to Turin for an interview. I had no idea who the company was. The company that interviewed me in Turin was actually Fiat, who owns Ferrari. And they were they were looking for the first guy who could lead Ferrari's design in their history because they never had a in-house design team in Ferrari. So anyways, um, we had lunch, and then we got to the dessert, and then they asked me about... You know, uh, they think they said, we think you're the right guy for it. But uh, would you want to be the first uh, the director of design for Ferrari and Maserati? And I think my tear of me went out horizontally because I couldn't believe, you know, they're asking me to be. You were getting to do that. Well, I, I was like, I only ever designed a couple cars and, you know, they, they were pretty much hits. But at the same time, that's kind of a big jump or that's the jump, you know. And so I couldn't say no, you know, if the pope asked you to go to rome you don't say no you go so so i went to ferrari and maserati and worked there for the next uh six seven years i guess and then went through fiat where i had to do the fiat 500 and that went really well and then right after that mclaren called me up in 2008 and they just told me you know we know you know we're a racing car company but we need a designer and i'm like yeah but i don't design race cars now, yeah, but we want to design a we want to start a road car company because if Formula One for our racing department ever goes down you know south, we have right. nothing. So we need to build a road car company and uh we want you to to do that and take over and do everything. So I couldn't I couldn't say no to that because that was basically clean sheet design for a company of that kind of caliber is unheard of. You know, you get a chance with a lot of different companies, but a company like McLaren, which their target was to be the English Ferrari, and to start from a clean sheet of paper, create the design language for for a company like that, and 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 have the backing of that kind of you know that that firepower that McLaren has. That's incredible. Yeah, I couldn't say no to that. A lot of pressure, but at the same time, it's turned out really well. So I've been happy. So I remember us sitting there chatting in uh, at the, that conference, and it, and you said something to me about that each of these cars, it, it, you are inspired by animals. Am Absolutely. I remembering this cor- correctly? Oh, 110 percent. And yeah. so what? So <laughs> tell me about what each of these cars. Which animal? Yeah. Well. Okay. So the the reason why is first of all, when you say animals, I I call it biomimicry, which is a science. Biomimicry is looking at, you know, your so designers have to get inspired by any number of things. Yeah. We get inspired by architecture, furniture, fashion, whatever. But I've never really relied on that because that's in one day and out the next in terms of trends and things. And I always thought car design has to be timeless, or at least try to make a car. There, there are products you want to be out there for a year, and then you want the customer to buy it, uh, the new, ver- new new, and upgraded and better version the next year. But with cars, it's a pretty big investment. I kind of feel like a car should last a long time design-wise and look good. So what better influence than nature as your design? Because nature is not trendy. It's not like, you know, this year that's in and next year it's out because it looks old. It doesn't happen in nature. So the more you can rely on nature as your design inspiration – 
for one, it's intelligent inspiration. Nothing in nature is over-designed. It's not under-designed. If it's not good design, it doesn't it, it doesn't live. It just dies off. It's a survival of the fittest. So so you're basically looking at the the best inspiration for anything to be designed. If you look in, into nature, how nature approaches that specific problem or uh, challenge that you're looking at. And with McLaren, I thought, okay, well, why don't we to develop our own new design language? We can do something that nobody else has done. You know, Ferraris have that very sexual, sensual appeal. Japanese are very science fiction like. German cars are very serious. French cars are quirky. You know, every country sort of has its own own look. And I thought, well, McLaren's a racing car company, and there's no fat on our cars. You know, all of them have uh, on the race cars. They have a very low BMI, if you want to put it that way, and they're just designed for purpose. So why don't we just take that philosophy? And look at animals in nature that are built for speed. And if you look at what's fast in nature, of course, the shape is important, aerodynamics, but it doesn't lead you to just one form. Because, for example, in the air, birds, you know, have to be aerodynamic and do the same thing, but they don't all look the same. They approach it from different angles, sure. as well as fish in the sea. Fish do the same thing. They have to go pretty fast when they're hunting or looking for, for food but they all have different shapes. So they all approach the same challenge, same target, same goal, but with different shapes and different solutions. So it's not like you're going to get locked into a design language that only has one solution. There's a lot of variety within nature. But the main thing that I I absorbed or have absorbed from biomimicry is that when the animal is a fast animal and an efficient animal, it's basically a shrink-wrapped animal. You know, you see you see the muscles, you see the, the tendons, the the bone sometimes it's basically no excess fat on that animal. I love so this. that became the design philosophy of, of McLaren where you start with what's called an engineering package. And this is where the driver sits. That's his vision angle. This is where the engine's going to be. The suspension is going to be mounted here. And basically those are what we call hard points that you can't move. The engineers give you those points the wheels are going to be here. The luggage goes here. The fuel tank sits here. Those don't move. Now, what you have to have as freedom as a designer is to design the body around that rib cage or around that skeleton organs and stuff that are already given to you. And that's why we all look the same. You know, we don't all have, you know, our, our skeletal structure is similar. So what I did was basically, it sounds weird, but almost in the principle of off the principle of taking a bed sheet throwing it over these hard points and letting it settle and by that you're just reducing the amount of material you need on the on the car so that reduces weight cost everything aerodynamic drag so our cars ended up looking shrink wrapped right and that was its own design language that nobody else had ever used before so we immediately had our our own look and of course you have to come in with a designer's eye later and sort of finesse the curves and the radiuses and and things like that and where surfaces blend together but that's just like cleaning up the design a little bit and they got a very distinctive look and uh not only a distinctive look but a very efficient look and yeah so that's worked very well and that's become the the sort of the the way mclarens are recognized so cool after i met you and you told me that story i happened to be in palm springs and at a hotel Mm. and for some reason i don't know if it was a mclaren convention or what was going on but there were five different models parked out front (laughs) and i just kept thinking about you i was you wanting to know the whole backstory on all of them it was amazing yeah so i want to uh make sure that we have time for i could talk to you all day i mean there's two really big (laughs) ones so predictions for cars moving forward you and i talked a little bit about this like and aspiring uh wannabe frank stevenson yeah. people i what what would you say what do you what do you go do well it's going to be interesting because right now the the trend seems to be heading towards the interior design of vehicles because it's like the new generation of children now are not so much into owning stuff but rather more the experiences they get mm-hmm. so you know, nobody really almost looks forward to getting their driver's license when they're when they're 16 or 18 or whatever age it is. It's almost like you know, I'll take an Uber if I have to get from here to there. I don't want to have the expenses of maintaining a vehicle or getting tickets or servicing it or resale or accidents. I don't know. There's so many things that you have to consider when you buy a car. 
that it's almost like a, it, it's a night, well, not a nightmare. It's just a generation change of way of thinking. They would rather just have the experience and actually have to take care of owning that product. So there is a shift right now towards cars almost almost being looked at as products instead of you know unique pieces that you own. You can basically use a car when you're finished with it. Somebody else can use it. The only thing that's really a, a weird one is this uh, this shift that we're having forced upon us all of a sudden with the COVID thing, the pandemic. And mass transportation is going to become a little bit different than what we're used to. And I, you know, I, I've still been working over this period, but there's a lot of emphasis from companies asking for new solutions to packaging on the interior of vehicles, on mass transport vehicles, such that you feel safer. And already the people are really rethinking interiors on airplanes, interiors on trains on subway systems so this whole thing is going to turn the interior of a vehicle as well as with the electric motors that are coming along which are a lot smaller into how we can really expand the space on the inside to give us more uh, a feeling of more more space how we can physically and, and scientifically decontaminate a car when people get out and more people are going to be coming in hepa um, filters are we going to see those in cars yes we will we're yeah. going to see that we're going to see Heat going up uh, very quickly inside the interior, up to about 135 degrees, which then influences the kind of adhesives that we use in cars, the materials that don't start to get too hot and things. It's a lot of new stuff coming into the game. So uh, I wouldn't say that design per se is going to change because we will always like or want beauty in our lives. You know, if you have a choice between driving a car that looks like a refrigerator as opposed to a car that looks like a, a beautiful piece of sculpture, sculpture. Um, I know there are people that would love to drive a refrigerator, but I'm not one of them. I don't think it's old school. I just think I like good looking things or aesthetically pleasing things. But but there is this trend that that beauty is going to be seen in the future as less important, I guess, than it is now. If you look at cars on the road today, they're trying so hard to give these cars their unique characters right. that they're going down that route where cars are becoming more more intent. The design is more of a shock value than it is a good value almost you know it's kind of preparing us for a um a world that's uh almost dy dystopia in a certain way it's like planning for the future with cars that are just meant to be sort of out of mad max and violent and aggressive and i don't like that i still think cars should look desirable attractive proportionally correct incredibly beautiful surfacing you know that stuff doesn't go out of style so well, you keep doing okay. what you're doing because I think that that just like uh, just like customers might not know exactly what they want. I I have a yeah. feeling during times like this when people are creating things that maybe they're reacting right and they think that that's a solution, but I think somebody like you really I I don't know. I think you see the future and and I think sticking to what your stakes in the ground are around design seem yeah. like the right the, the right way to well, do it. Like I said at the beginning, Karen, we can't we can't stay in the past or as the way things are. We I, I am currently working on uh two different projects that would probably blow most people's minds at the moment in the sense that they would think that they won't be seeing it in their generation and in, in their lifetime. But in the space of the next four years, we will start seeing flying taxis. In other words, vertical takeoff and landing jets Amazing. that uh, are kind of like the Uber of the sky that cost less than road cars or road taxis because there's no infrastructure. So those are going to be transporting us from airports to city centers or, or from cities to rural areas. So those are the new little flying pods, electrical flying pods that are I coming. I cannot wait. To, to it's see amazing. That. I could talk to you all day, Frank. I went, where is the Thanks. best place for people to find you? Obviously, if you haven't seen Frank's uh, movie that he was a part of, Chasing Perfect, amazing. Mm -hmm. I went and saw it after uh, after you mentioned it to me. It's really, really good. And cool. uh, and you've got a YouTube channel as well. And it's just under Frank Stevenson, correct? Correct. Yeah, we had actually it's a it's a big coincidence, but today we hit 100k subscribe, 100,000 subscribers, and, and we just started, but it's going really well there, Kara. That's and, terrific. Uh, that's Frank Stephenson, how I designed. I love and then, it. There's a whole whole list of stuff on there. That's out there. Then we have um, 
Yeah, just the the film is a good one to watch. Chasing Perfect, the website franksephenson.com. But the big thing is keep your eyes peeled very soon, actually in October of next year. So just under a year from now, two cars that I'm working on will be attached to SpaceX in October next year. And they're flying up to the moon and they're going to be the first two cars to race oh my on the lunar surface. That is awesome. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be an awesome project. And, super, uh, super cool. New technology, new materials, everything. It's it, it doesn't get any crazier than that. That is awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Frank. And Pleasure. everybody, if you like this episode, which I, of course, did, five stars, subscribe. And Frank, we're going to have to have you back and talk more about all, all of your other projects that you're doing because you're just so love inspiring. To. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon and rest of the week. Before we sign off, I want to talk to you about fear. People like to talk about fearless leaders, but achieving big goals isn't about fearlessness. Successful leaders recognize their fears and decide to deal with them head on in order to move forward. This is where my new book, Undaunted, comes in. This book is designed for anyone who wants to succeed in the face of fear, overcome doubts, and live a little undaunted. Order your copy today at undauntedthebook.com and learn how to look your doubts and doubters in the eye and achieve your dreams. For a limited time, you'll also receive a free case of Hint Water. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to Spotlight? Send me a tweet at Kara Golden and let me know. And if you like what you heard, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Golden. Thanks for listening.